I bet most of us have at least that one game that maybe isn't all that well known and it may have some very apparent flaws in it which makes it hard to recommend for people to play. But something about it still makes it easily one of your favorites of all time. For me, that game is Arcanum. Small development studio called Troika Games, founded in 1997, released three games before shutting its doors in 2005. These games were Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, The Temple of Elemental Evil, and Arcanum of Steamworks and Magic Obscura. While Troika Games was a small studio, the three founding members were not just some nobodies, since they were the key members behind the game called Fallout. Timothy Kane was a producer, lead programmer and main designer of Fallout, who would later on work on titles like Pillars of Eternity in Obsidian Entertainment as a senior programmer. Jason D. Anderson worked on Fallout as a lead designer and would later on work on, for example, In Exile Entertainment's Faceland 2 as a creative director. Leonard Boyarski, who worked for Fallout as an art director, has later on joined Obsidian Entertainment as well. Kane, Anderson and Boyarski decided to found their own development studio after running into creative differences with Interplay during the development of Fallout 2, on which they were all working on at the time. And thank goodness they did, since the first project they decided to work on was an isometric, open-world steampunk fantasy RPG. Arcanum. The game takes place in a fictional world of Arcanum, which is inhabited by your typical fantasy-style races like elves, dwarves, gnomes, ogres and, of course, humans. But there's a twist. The world of Arcanum is in the middle of a technological revolution. We kind of said after doing Fallout as a post musical game, we really wanted our turn at making a fantasy game. But because of the nature of how we are, we didn't. We of course couldn't make a typical fantasy game. We needed some kind of, of twist. And what we decided to do was rather than set our fantasy game in the 14th century, which almost every fantasy game seems to be mired in, which is wagons and you know horses and, and castles and moats, we said, well, what if an industrial revolution happened in a, in, a, in a world like that? And it was the 18th century, and you were getting locomotives and steam-powered engines how would that affect dwarves and elves and orcs? And I think it was Leonard Pararski immediately went, well, you know, the orcs would be used as the slaves of all the, the capitalist machinery. And so we, we kind of ran with that. We said, what would it, what, we, we went down each race. What would, happen, what would the elves do? What would the dwarves do? What would the orcs do? Um, and we worked it out. And we kind of, this, it, it, it sprang together. It sprang to life very quickly. Arcanum kind of, within a month or two, had fully formed into this, Victorian feeling society that was this weird mix of, of 18th century technology and magic. The main theme of the game is the constant conflict between magic and technology, and how these different forces affect the world and the people of Arcanum. Magic bends the rules of physical law, while technology enforces it. This dichotomy between magic and technology is strongly present in both the gameplay elements and the writing of the game, but I'll get more into that a bit later on with some examples. The game opens with a cutscene that tells you that you are one of the passengers on a virgin flight of IFS Zephyr, a zeppelin that is considered very high-end technology in the world of Arcanum. This luxurious setting is quickly shattered by the Zeppelin being attacked by two smaller aircrafts, piloted by ogres who managed to crash the Zeppelin, but also kill themselves in the process. You wake up within the burning rubbles of the destroyed Zeppelin, and hear someone calling for help under the debris. You discover a near-death elderly gnome, who on his dying breath begs of you to find the boy and give him his silver ring. After this, the gnome dies, and you're approached by a shadowy figure, and the cutscene ends. 
The shadowy figure turns out to be a man named Virgil, a priest of Panari religion who tells you that as the sole survivor of this terrible accident, you fill the role in an ancient elven prophecy of the Living One, and that you are the reincarnation of a powerful elf named Nasruddin. This might sound like a rather video gamey decision of the developers to put the player character immediately in the shoes of someone greater, and destined to do all these great things. But just listen how the game presents all this to you. You speak! I, I mean, of, of course you speak. What am I, a blathering idiot? Wait, what, what did you say? Maybe I should be writing all of this down. I am at a loss here. I, I, I don't quite know what to do. Uh, I mean, you are the... the oh, of course you are. I mean, you do know who you are, right? Of course you do. What, what, what sort of brainless, half-baked question is that for the... the, uh, the uh, what, 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 what do you call yourself? Yes, yes, of course. You see, you're him. I, I mean, the uh, the reincarnation of a uh, uh, what's his name? I I can never remember. And and I, I'm always getting him mixed up with the other fellow, the the bad one. You um, well, you know how all of those old elven names sound the same. <laughs> uh, hmm. The altar should clear things up for us a bit. Hmm. It says uh. And the spirit of Nazaruddin shall be reborn on wings of fire in hills shrouded in fog, and fight the last battle with the evil one. I'm sorry, but I don't know. <laughs> I guess we better find out considering you're supposed to fight him. Instead of the game doing all this exposition through some holier-than-thou character, here's Virgil, a complete rookie as a priest of his own religion, more shocked about the prophecy actually being through than you the player character seem to be, stuttering with his words and unable to figure out what to say to you or even how to act around you. With this first dialogue of Virgil, the game shows just a taste of the writhing in this game, by poking fun at itself and some video game tropes in general. But it also showcases the amazing voice acting of the game. Naturally, there being huge amounts of characters to talk to in the game, not all of them can be voice acted. But main companions and other main characters of the game are voice acted excellently, breathing a lot of life into their personalities, and you can really hear how much fun the voice actors had while delivering their lines. Never ask a dwarf the name of his clan! I'd sooner cut my beard than tell you the sacred name of my people! Such an action might be considered blasphemy! And as for my family, that's none of your concern. A strange little man, a bit overdressed, but kind-hearted and very intelligent. I was young then, a mere 160 years old. He was the first human I'd ever seen. His name? It was a long time ago. But I remember because he said it so often. I think humans just like hearing the sound of their own names. <laughs> Terwilliger. Dr. Renford A. Terwilliger. I can hear him saying it even now. <laughs> yes, 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 I'm getting to that. I think the old chap was buried with something, something powerful. And whatever it is, finally got out, and now every dead John and Barry in this town is coming back to dinner. <laughs> uh, quite a good story, if that's your cup of tea. By a quite a tragic coincidence, one of the voice actors of the game, Barry Denon, who is also known, for example, as the voice of Fat Man in Metal Gear Solid 2, passed away while I was creating this video. And he just happens to deliver my favorite line in the whole game. Humans, in comparison with the other races, live such short lives. Because of this, I believe that every human action is motivated through fear. The fear of death. You would think that this was a relative issue, that humans would learn to live with this limitation and accept it. This is not true. And therefore, humans, when confronted with any situation, see it through the veil of their own mortality. Achieve, advance, perform. Humans are constantly driven by the shadow of their own death. This fear, unfortunately, clouds their judgment, deadens their sense of right and wrong. Humans act first, 
think later and feel last of all. At this point I just want to say that the writing and the dialogue in this game is exceptional for me since it just, well, clicks with me. I definitely feel that you can go overboard with writing as well, even if it would be well done so to speak. One of the examples of this is the more recent Pillars of Eternity, a game which has such huge amounts of lore exposition thrown your way at all times that it actually made the game heavy to enjoy at times because of it. I respect the amount of effort that went into the writing of that game and as a whole I actually like the game, but that writing style isn't for me. In Arcanum short conversations are short and sweet and longer ones always felt interesting enough for me to keep reading or listening. For the sake of the gods, out with it, man! There's enough humor in the mix there to balance out many dark themes the game tackles and this is really important since you as the main character will find yourself in the middle of some difficult situations and decisions where the line of right and wrong is often very blurred and the game often tricks you and plays with your expectations. You can be well-meaning Mr. Goody Goody, thieving, murdering and rude son of a bitch or perhaps something in between. Whatever you end up doing or being in the game, the game will react to it accordingly and has some options prepared for you. Actually, there are some very good examples of this very early on in the game. Near the crash site, you can find a cave where a ghost of a man named Charles Brego is in great pain and he tells you that he and his friend had been cursed by an evil priest named Arbala, who lives nearby. His friend, driven mad by the curse, killed Charles Brego and now he is trapped by the curse in this cave, unable to leave the world of the living. The ghost asks you to kill Arbala to release him from the curse. If you decide to help the ghost and travel to Arbala's house, you can see two gravestones in front of the house of which upon further inspection reveal that here lies someone's wife and son. The graves are freshly digged. This for more suspecting players would already ring a bell that there might be more to this story. But when you enter Arbala's house and he asks who you are, you are given the dialogue option I am your executioner, which lets you blindly attack and kill Arbala fulfilling the request of Charles Brego. However, if you decide to talk a bit more with Arbala, he reveals that Charles Brego and his accomplice Simon Fargus killed Arbala's wife and son and stole his magical artifact. And that's why he cursed them. This gives you the option to help Arbala instead and he asks you to find out where the Brego's accomplice is hiding with the magical artifact. So you make your way back to Charles Brego's ghost who laughs at you for almost killing Arbala for him, revealing his true nature. When asked about the whereabouts of Simon Fargus, he says that it's useless for him to reveal the location of his partner in crime since he's dead and trapped here forever anyways. But this gives you the option to lie to Charles Brego and tell him that Arbala can actually remove his agonizing curse and set him free if he reveals the location to you. Charles Brego sees this as his last chance so he will tell you the location of Simon's shack on your map and tells you to hurry since he's in terrible pain due to the curse. Now you can travel to the shack where Simon is hiding with the artifact. You can either attack him or intimidate him to hand the artifact to you. When you bring the stolen artifact back to Arbala, it completes the good version of this quest and he will even grant his blessing on you. Now, this is only the first minor side quest you can find in the game, but it already shows you that characters and stories in the game have depth and different possible outcomes and the game lets you roleplay them out accordingly to who you have decided your character in the game is. By the way, Arba does not lift the curse of Charles Brego, but if you're somewhat of a good guy, you don't need to tell this to Charles and never return. But here's the good part. There's actually a dialogue option to tell Charles that you lied to him and he will be rotting here for all eternity, leaving Charles screaming in pain in that lonely cave forever. This dialogue option has no benefits whatsoever gameplay wise, but shows how present the roleplay aspect is in the game at all times. What? Not evil. evil. Enough for your needs? Well, you also have the option to kill Arbala even after receiving his blessing and go back to Charles Brego and complete the evil version of the quest as well for some more quest XP and you are presented with yet another dialogue option where you can confess that you actually enjoy killing innocent people. You can be a dick, you can be evil, if that's what you want to be. And it's brilliant. 
Shrouded Hills is very likely to be the first village you find in the game, and even in this small village you're given different ways to approach different tasks. You can help the Shrouded Hills constable to deal with the band of thieves that blackmail people at the only bridge leading out of the town, you can kill the thieves, you can persuade them to let you through, or accept their quest to destroy the bridge materials the villagers are using to build another bridge out of town. There's a mage whose magical properties are distracted by the village's new steam engine and he asks you to destroy it. This will help the mage's business to flourish but holds this withering village back from achieving financial stability without the working steam engine. If you do not want to destroy the steam engine, you can also tell the constable of Shrouded Hills that the mage is plotting to destroy the steam engine, leading to a whole different outcome for the village. You're offered to join the bank robbery by a shady person near the local bob, while later on another person asks you to join the card force protecting the bank. Choices are everywhere. Choices that affect how people will see you in the future, and how the game judges you on the scale of the powers of magic and technology. Even the NPC companions in the game have their own views on what is good or evil. So if you decide to slaughter or steal in front of some companions whose worldview does not match with what you're doing, you can eventually see them turning against you. Hey, I don't understand why we're attacking such a decent type. I won't do this for much longer. Some NPCs are more morally bankrupt even, and see you as a weakling for showing too much mercy to people. I will not follow one who travels the path of righteousness. So the main story is about you finding the boy who the silver ring belongs to, and finding out where you fit in this mysterious prophecy Virgil introduces you to. But the journey through the game takes you to many different places around the Arcanum, varying from huge technologically advanced cities like Tarant, that for example has its own railway station, sewer system, library, docks and even brothel. You can have sex with this ship. To Quintara, hidden city of elves that stands as one of the few places still left almost untouched by the industrial revolution. The absolutely enormous world of Arcanum is fully open for you from the start of the game, and great majority of the locations in the world are either well hidden or completely optional, encouraging exploration. I still have my original coffee stain littered player guide that came with the game, filled with my own notes about different coordinates for all the secret locations that I found. Before you laugh at me, I just want to remind you that this was from the age when not all info could yet be so easily found from the internet, so I needed to be resourceful and write these locations down for the future playthroughs, so I could find them again. And may I just mention real fast that this player guide is absolutely amazing. It has 200 pages of useful info about the game, both about the history of the game world and handy tips for the players. It even has a goddamn bread recipe in it. Before I get completely lost in my fanboy nostalgia, let me talk a bit more about the actual gameplay of Arcanum. Let's start with the very first seconds of the game, which is naturally creating your own character. The bread and butter of all role-playing games. The devs have given you an option to pick from a couple of pre-made characters if you lack imagination, but I highly suggest making your own character from the scratch. All the different races have different starting strengths and weaknesses, and different people will react to you in certain ways depending on your race as well. And yes, the world of Arcanum is often very racist. Racial tensions and class differences are apparent almost everywhere around the Arcanum, and even when it's portrayed through these fantasy races that don't really exist, there's some stuff here that is not too far from our recent real-world history. My favorite thing about the character creation is picking your background. There's plenty of different ones to choose from which all come with positive and negative effects. And even if the game does give you an option to not pick a significant background, I suggest reading through these different background options and see if something fits you. For example, you can be a ladies man, possessing almost unnatural beauty and constant admiration of women, but lack the usual mandatory traits like physical strength. You can be a bookworm who spent a lot of time indoors reading books granting you intelligence, but also took its toll on your eyesight causing you to lose perception. Maybe you are an extreme personality and you make everyone in the world either hate or love you without a middle ground. 
One of the most hilarious things you can do in the game is to create a super ugly and super stupid half ogre brute who is unstoppable killing machine on the battlefield, but is in deep trouble in social situations, making the conversations with people the hardest challenge in the game instead of combat. By the gods! I cannot believe that the living one has been reincarnated in the body of an imbecile! Before I start talking about the actual combat though, let's take a look at the stats screen. If you're not all that interested in how different character stats in the game affect your character build, go into the time displayed on the screen now to skip this section of the video. So there's 8 base stats you can level up that are divided into 2 categories, physical stats and mental stats. Physical stats consists of strength, constitution, dexterity and beauty. Strength determines your physical damage output, ability to carry more stuff before getting encumbered, success with throwable items and it also affects your health bar and damage bonus. Constitution affects your fatigue bar, healing rate and resistance to poisons. Dexterity affects numerous skills like bows, dodge, melee, throwing, backstab, pickpocketing, prowling and lockpicking. It also affects your character speed and armor class. Beauty affects the reactions of NPCs towards you. Mental stats consist of intelligence, willpower, perception and charisma. Intelligence affects your ability to use skills and learn schematics and even opens up new dialogue options in conversations. Willpower affects your ability to learn spells, resistances against skills and spells, haggling and both health and fatigue. Perception affects your ability to use ranged weapons and both your prowling skill and disarm trap skill. Charisma affects how many NPC companions you can have in your party and it also affects your persuasion skill. Every time you level up after getting enough experience points that you can get by doing combat or finishing quests, you get one point that you can use into whatever you like. Every 5 levels you get 2 points, which always feels nice. On top of these 8 base stats, you can decide to put your points into just basic health that determines how much hits you can take in combat before you die, or fatigue that acts as your stamina, determining how much you are able to cast spells, but also how much your character can take before getting exhausted and knocked down. And believe me, you don't want to get knocked down in this game. You heard me mentioning different skills while talking about the 8 base stats. So let's go over the skills that you can level up as well. Skills come in 4 categories. Combat skills, thieving skills, social skills and technological skills. Combat skills are used for attacking or defending during combat. These affect your ability to use bows, dodge opponent's attacks, land more successful hits in melee combat and your efficiency when throwing items. Thieving skills are mainly used by thieves, but also have non-criminal uses. These affect your ability to land deadly backstabs on your opponent, pickpocketing, your ability to prowl undetected and spot traps. Social skills are used on other people during social situations. These affect your ability to gamble, haggle for prices, heal wounds and persuade other people. Technological skills are used for your efficiency with technology. These affect your ability to repair items, use firearms, pick locks and disarm traps. As I mentioned earlier, in the world of Arcanum, technology and magic both exist, but yet cannot coexist. This is also visualized by this meter that shows how magic or tech savvy your character is, and it will start to point either direction depending on your actions in the game. Magic oriented characters can get better benefits out of magic equipment and better success at casting spells, but try picking up a repeater rifle and you can accidentally shoot your own hand off with it. While technologically experienced character can build and handle amazing technological marvels, but will find magical health potions as useful as dirty tap water. You can try to achieve middle ground by not using either magical or technological items, but if you decide to go either direction, you can either learn spells or craft items. Magic oriented characters can learn spells from 16 different schools of magic, totaling to 80 different spells that come in huge variety from straight up combat spells to slowing down time, teleporting, summoning or raising the dead with necromancy for example. Technological oriented characters can learn to craft different items from 8 technological disciplines, totaling to 56 different items. 
Schematics for additional items can also be both and found around the game world. Finally, there is one thing I still want to bring attention to in the character stats screen, and that's the actual visual meter you have for how good or evil you are, which is very satisfying to take a look at every now and then if you're really playing for either camp while roleplaying. I've avoided it long enough, so I guess it's time to talk about the combat system of the game, since you're very likely to do a lot of combat in the game. Sadly, the combat in the game is serviceable at best, and not all that special most of the time. Mostly consisting of you clicking on the enemy you want to attack, and that's it. You can issue comments for your party members, target different party parts, and use different items and spells that spice up the combat a bit, but not an awful lot. The game gives you options to switch between turn-based or real-time combat, of which I highly recommend the turn-based one, since the real-time combat feels like it's moving on double the speed that it should, not giving you any time to react to anything, pretty much removing any possible tactical element from the fights. Uh, friend, I've been wounded terribly. Quickly, I need healing. While the combat is nothing new or strange for a person who has played some other games from this era or genre, it's still very simple in its core. There will of course be fights where you need to think about how exactly you will handle things, and it can even feel rather rewarding at times. Still, most of the time if you find yourself in a really tough combat situation, you more likely start to plan how to cheese your way out of it. This is mainly caused by some very unforgiving difficulty spikes this game can have at times. Take a habit of quick saving often and prepare to get mercilessly fucked if you wander off to a wrong neighborhood unprepared. Unfortunately, sometimes you can be driven in a situation which just completely overwhelms you without real answer other than death. By casually fast traveling through the game world, the chances are that you mostly encounter small wolves where it feels appropriate, and maybe even some bandits you can persuade to leave you alone, or bribe them with some coin. But you're shit out of luck if you happen to run into a bear with its cups. There's no bribe in the bears, and most likely you will be ripped apart in a matter of seconds. Ugh, I've been seriously hurt, sir. Please help me. One of the biggest of these difficulty spikes for most players happens in the middle of a large dungeon area, which forces you to either be prepared for the bullshit that's coming, or swallow your pride and prepare for a long backtrack back to safety. Take my word for it. When you travel into the Black Mountain mines, just be prepared, okay? The game is not balanced, at all, and some of the skills are almost useless compared to others. I'm looking at you, spot traps. While the traps in the game can be nasty, the only place where I honestly felt like I would have needed the spot trap skill was an area where the game generously gives you a couple of magical scrolls which give you temporal ability to spot traps anyway, rendering the actual spot trap skill near useless thing to waste your leveling points on. My favorite character type to play in the game is a well-mannered gentleman with pretty good social skills and uses self-crafted firearms and drawable weapons like Molotov cocktails in combat. While having firearms is powerful in combat due to the range benefit you often get against your opponents, I constantly found myself running out of bullets, and firearms being my main tool for combat that usually meant unavoidable death for me. The vanilla game is also littered with bugs, big and small of which some were even game-breaking. Although Arcanium was well received getting relatively high scores on many publications upon its release, the overall bugginess of it was the main criticism it got for a good reason. I highly recommend installing the unofficial fan patch for the game that fixes almost all of the issues, both bugs and the worst balance issues, while even adding some extra content to the game that the developers didn't have time to add to the vanilla version. While I'm already talking about the game's negative aspects, you might have already noticed that the game isn't exactly a looker, is it? The game looked a bit outdated even when it first came out in 2001, and frankly, age hasn't done any magic on the visuals either. This is probably the biggest reason why it is so difficult to sell this game for people, at this day and age. However, what the game might lack in visuals, it takes back in atmosphere. This is partly because of the excellent writing and believable game world I already mentioned, but also because of the phenomenal soundtrack composed by Ben Yush. 
The soundtrack of Arcanum purely consists of songs played by a string quartet and managed to keep very consistent and unique soundscape together during the whole game. The melancholy that overshadows the ruined city of a once great kingdom, the playful tune of the elven city of Quintara, or the menacing atmosphere when you explore the dark tunnels of forgotten mines, that almost sounds like the cellist is about to backstab you. Definitely one of my favorite video game soundtracks of all time, that fits the 18th century-ish setting of Arcanum perfectly. Most people have played or at least heard of Fallout games by now, partly because of the serious silken in sequels to this day. But sadly, Arcanum is way lesser known and never received a sequel of its own. But here comes the worst part. Arcanum's sequel was actually in the making. As was revealed by a leaked design documents that have been later confirmed to be legitimate, the sequel was supposed to carry the name Journey to the Center of Arcanum, and it was meant to be a 3D first-person game using Valve's Source engine, the same engine Half-Life 2 and Vampire the Masquerade uses. Their goal was to make the gameplay to feel similar to Deus Ex and Thief, but with Arcanum's brilliant world design. Unfortunately, the sequel got sacked after Sierra and Valve arrived into some disagreement and Troika was left without a publisher for the game. It's highly likely that we will never see another Arcanum game, but who knows? Some respected old school RPGs have gotten sequels lately like Wasteland and Planescape Torment, and new games of that style have been critically well received like Pillars of Eternity, showing that there's definitely still audience for games like this. Maybe there is still some hope left for Arcanum sequel in the future. I sure hope so, since whether I was solving a murder mystery at the streets of Caledon or finding out how the first Steam Engine came to be, I was always fully immersed in the world of Arcanum. And it's the world I return to at least once a year. Thank you for watching and take care. And I tell people sometimes that there's more of me in Fallout and Arcanum than in any other game I made because it was just, it was made with a small group. And so it's not as, um, the, the part of me that you feel in the game is not as diluted as it is in, in games that are made with a bigger group of people.